the flash card topic is the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. The idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a chronic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia of unknown cause, considered most common idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. It's the most common cause of pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis presented by the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern in HRCT. Among the old lung diseases, we have an entity called interstitial lung disease. More than 200 diseases. Parts of the interstitial lung disease are the pulmonary fibrosis. So not all interstitial lung disease, disease has fibrosis. There is a group within interstitial lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis, the initiating diseases, and the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis comes in the middle or the center of this group, which is the topic today. As you see here in the pulmonary fibrosis group, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis from the start is included within the circle of pulmonary fibrosis. It means that it is, starts as fibrosis and progress as fibrosis. And recently discovered that it is epithelial fibroblastic activity. The other is the progressive fibrosing lung disease like smoking-related, autoimmune-related, hypersensitivity monites, medication-induced fibrosis, occupation-related fibrosis, all have element of inflammation. And by progression, it ends by fibrosis. And this is the unique thing regarding idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. At its, from the start, it's fibrosis process and the treatment, that's why not recommended to be immunosuppression. And we will talk about it later more. The idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis constitute of 20% of the pulmonary fibrosis pathologies, same as the chronic hypersensitivity pneumonites, same as connective tissue disease, interstitial lung disease, same as sarcoidosis, and the remaining 20% divided into pneumoconiosis, 10%, and other interstitial lung diseases, the remaining 10%. Here, I show you the treatment of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, current therapies, the medication are antifibrotic drugs, including perfinidone and nentilanib, and some symptomatic medicine like oral corticosteroid opioid for anti effect and antacid for the reduction of the GERD. The rule of the fibro antifibrotic drugs is to slow down the rate of the progression of the fibrosis. If these drugs failed and the patient in severe condition, progressive condition, he will go undergo the lung transplantation. The future, in the future of the therapies that are planned now and it's in ongoing more studies are the this group of medicine and including stem cell. And it's not the interest of our topic, but I'm showing you that the medicine is not including the immunosuppression. In one of the early slides, I showed that the pattern which present the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. The usual interstitial pneumonia pattern belongs to this heterogeneous group of diseases, which are the center of the interstitial lung diseases. 
by other mean that other pathologies of interstitial lung disease can present with this one of these eight patterns. However, our topic today about the usual interstitial pneumonia, how it looks. Here, the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, if the usual interstitial pneumonia is idiopathic, it will represent only the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Otherwise, if it is secondary, it can be shared by many of other diseases of connective tissue disease like rheumatoid arthritis. It's one of the common, common connective tissue disease, and it's the only one that in favor of presentation if fibrotic by the usual interstitial pneumonia. The others prefer to present with the other pattern, the non-specific interstitial pneumonia like scleroderma, like uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. However, the idiopathic, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia belongs to the major inter idiopathic interstitial pneumonia group, including here the chronic fibrosic interstitial pneumonia, which are either idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or non-specific interstitial pneumonia. In another flashcard, I will go through this group in a special flashcard. <clears throat> now we go to the interesting part of this flashcard. There is a new UIP classification provided by Fleschner Society on 2018. And also the same topic was uh, pub published by the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society. And all these groups or societies divided the UIP into typical, probable, indeterminate, and alternative diagnosis. Here, I'm showing you that there is clinical practice guidelines provided by American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society, Japanese Respiratory Society, plus the Fleischner white paper consensus statement. Both major groups interested in thoracic imaging The HRCT pattern are divided into four by each of the group. They are sharing the same everything, except what I will mention for, to you now. The American Thoracic Society and others, they give the name of UIP if the picture is typical for the UIP. And another entity is probable UIP, then indeterminate UIP, then alternative diagnosis. So the difference, if you compare here to the Fleschner, the UIP is called typical UIP in by Fleschner group. Probable UIP the same. The indeterminate the same to the American Thoracic Society. Here, another difference, the name, instead of alternative diagnosis, it is called most consistent, consistent with non-IPF diagnosis. For me, and what I like to mention, I like to I like to use the typical UIP if I am talking about what is considered picture, the, the definite picture of UIP. I prefer to take this name because this is confusing in reporting. The I use the probable UIP also, indeterminate UIP, but here I prefer the name given by American Thoracic Society, alternative diagnosis, instead of using this long name. So I use the typical UIP and alternative diagnosis in description of these four plus the probable UIP and indeterminate UIP. What is the difference more that we can pick it up from these different not different, they are typical, but they are different in these names, naming the naming of the UIP pattern, plus how they consider the probable UIP uh, in treatment, how to reach diagnosis in management. In case of American Thoracic Society, they consider some cases need 
biopsy to be diagnosed as probably IP. In the Fleshner, the considered in not in not in not if, if non needed non -needed, unneeded uh, biopsy and they treat it like the typical IP biopsy not recommended and probably IP biopsy not recommended again. So there was a debate. There is a debate regarding this stage. However, we will understand it later. Now I will go for this. And why I am giving you all this introduction because the Royal College of Radiologists produced this cycle. In this cycle, they recommend that if in case of suspicion for IPF, all patients should be categorized into one of the four HRCT patterns. <clears throat> UIP pattern, probable UIP pattern, and determined for UIP pattern or alternative. Here they are using the terminology of the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society. Only I like to use the typical for description here. However, in case of indeterminate UIP or alternative diagnosis, the most likely diagnosis or differential diagnosis should be suggested in the report. And the target is to reach that 100% of the HRC reports patient with suspected IPF or interstitial lung disease should be categorized into one of four categories. And I think this is very deficient in reports of radiologists until now. Now we'll go to the UIP pattern and how it looks and how each category look. The first and most important sign is the honeycombing. The definition of honeycombing that you can see and apply on the image, when you see a single layer or multi-layer, however each works, of contiguous thick walled cyst stacked along the plural, plural surface, as you see here, here multiple, multiple layers, thick walled cyst stacked directly along the plural surface. Here, more tiny cysts, thick walled stacked along the plural surface. When you see this pattern, this is honeycombing. So you are dealing with typical UIP pattern. The other feature of fibrosis that you can see generally and in UIP pattern is the traction bronchiexis and traction bronchiolexis. Here, I don't need to give a definition. Here you see that there's non-tapering of the bronchus when it is directed distally into the lung. It should be tapering. Here it's non-tapering and here it looks beaded. Here, non-tapering. The bronchiolectasis are the bronchi bronchiolectatic dilatation of the bronchi. So both are the second sign of fibrosis. In general, honeycombing and traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis. And the other feature Mm, here, here, this is a, another point. This is magnified image to show you because it's important to differentiate between traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis. This is the bronchus dilated, and here are the bronchiolectasis, and this should be differentiated as well from the honeycombing because it makes difference. If it is honeycombing, you will be in typical UIP. If no honeycombing, it will be probable. As you see here, these are just traction bronchiolectasis. These are the bronchiectasis. This is the, again, honeycombing versus traction bronchiectasis. Here are the honeycombing, multiple thick wall cysts stacked along the plural surface. Here, as you see, these are traction bronchiectasis here. We can use also the minimum intensity projection to show the continuity of the bronchiolectasis with the bronchiectasis. It's a continuity of that, not 
separate thick wall cyst. And as you see here also, it's not stacked to the pleural aspect. Number three of the pulmonary fibrosis features, first one was honeycombing, second one was the traction bronchiectasis, bronchiolectasis, the third one is the irregular reticulation. Irregular reticulation or the interlobular septa and intralobular lines when they are thickened and irregular. As you know from the anatomy, the smallest visible unit on HRCT, if there is abnormality is the secondary pulmonary lobule. The boundaries of the secondary pulmonary lobules are made of interlobular septa. Plus, within the secondary pulmonary lobules, there is the intralobular lines. If these two thickened and irregular, so it, when you cannot differentiate between them or discriminate between this and that, most of the time in the case of the irregular Reticulation, so we call it irregular reticulation in case of fibrosis, as we cannot differentiate between them, and it's of nonsense to differentiate with them, between them. That the target or the aim is that we can recognize the irregular reticulation seen on the periphery of the lung fields. These fibrotic features will cause fibrosis and loss of volume. The loss of volume, the best to assess the volume loss because of the tendency of UIP pattern of fibrosis to involve more the lower lobes, there will be reduction of the size of the lower lobe. What will happen? The major fissure, which should be reaching always the anterior costophrenic angle and touching the anterior chest wall, the sternum, that you will see it withdrawn backward to reach only the diaphragmatic surface. As you see here, there is volume loss of lower lobe here, and there is traction of the major fissure posteriorly. This a result, consequence of lung fibrosis. Now we'll go for the UIP4 patterns. We have the typical UIP pattern, probable UIP pattern, indeterminate UIP pattern, and here, alternative diagnosis. Now we'll go how to differentiate between them through the next slides. In the typical UIP pattern, once you recognize the presence of honeycombing, so this is typical UIP pattern. If it is IPF, it will be more lower lobar, or in other words, it will be lower lobar predilection, periphery located, basal gradient, <clears throat> gradually increasing from upper loop and downward to the lower loops. This is the typical UIP pattern if it belongs to the IPF. Presence of honeycombing make it typical UIP, but if not following this distribution, it will be typical UIP pattern to non-IPF entity. And on the next slides, we will understand this more. So the typical UIP pattern, once then, Radiologists reach confidence to its diagnosis. It's important not to mention in the conclusion any differential diagnosis. If you mention typical UIP pattern, so no need to mention any differential diagnosis, or otherwise you will lose the and the importance of what you said. Then, if you mention the differential diagnosis means that you are confused and the pulmonologist will have bad perception about it. If you are confident to the UIP typical pattern, so write a typical pattern alone. Otherwise, he will understand that you are not so understanding for this topic 
because typically IP pattern means no surgical lung biopsy needed. But if you if you write if there is differential diagnosis for the typically IP pattern means that you are confused, you are not so understanding for this topic, and this will lose the value of your report, and he will show it to another radiologist to check it again. So if you reach to the the fact that you are convinced 100% that it's typical IP, write it as a conclusion picture of typical UIP pattern, and that's it. And in this case, you will think it is primary or secondary, or you may, may not think yeah, from this point that only typical UIP pattern is enough as a radiologist. But if you want to add more value, so you can search for the reason for this typical pattern, is it idiopathic or not? From my point of view, I think if you can reach something to mention if it is primary or secondary, it's easier to find the any features that to suggest that it is secondary. But it's very hard to prove that it's primary because the IPF is a multidisciplinary uh, team work and maybe by investigations, by lab, by serology, they will discover that there is a hidden connective tissue disease behind that. So if you find something striking that UIP pattern could be due to alternative diagnosis as in case of chronic hypersensitive nights, so this would alternate everything. It's a typical UIP pattern of chronic hypersensitive nights or it would be secondary to rheumatoid if the patient given history as having rheumatoid arthritis. So this pattern could be for secondary consequence to rheumatoid arthritis. Otherwise, you can just mention this is typical UIP pattern if you recognize honeycombing within the image. Here, for example, this case, it's following the distribution that we mentioned, it's peripheral only. If you can see here, no central, no bronchocentricity for the changes of fibrosis. So it's only peripherally located and more basal. So this is typically UIP pattern. More likely it's due to IPF. There are some signs helpful that can make you suggest there is connective tissue disease behind this usual interstitial pneumonia. These specific signs, anterior upper lobe sign, four corner sign, exuberant honeycombing sign, straight edge sign. These are the signs. These are the four corner you see the honeycombing in four corners, in the upper loops and the lower loops. Or if you don't consider too much the honeycombing behind in the lower loops, so it, this is the anterior corner. This is what is meant. We will give some examples later. The other finding here, the straight edge sign that there is sharp demarcation between the normal lung and the diseased lung with the honeycombing. This is the straight edge sign. Plus in this sign, there is no extension for the honeycombing along the pleural walls, only limited to the lung bases. In the IOIP pattern, because of IPF, the, there is epicobasal gradient. But here, the fibrosis or honeycombing only confined to the lung bases. The other sign, which is the exuberant honeycombing, that honeycombing represent more than 70% of the fibrosis. It's not present in the same percentage of the attraction bronchiectasis and reticular reticulation. The honeycombing is the striking and almost the main or the only finding in the image, more than 70%, and leaving only 30% for the other things like direction bronchiectasis, bronchiolectasis, and irregular reticulation.
يعني فور اكزامبل هير ان يو اي بي ديو تو اي بي اف يو كان سي ذا هاني كومينج الونج ذا بلورال اسبيكتس لاترالي بات اف يو سي ذات ذا هاني كومينج اوكيبينج ذا انتيريور بورشن اوف ذا ابر لوب ذيس انتيريور كورنر سو ذيس از ويذ كونكتيف تيشو ديزيز يو اي بي Here, the difference between exuberant honeycombing and the honeycombing in UIP IPF. Here, this is honeycombing, exuberant sign, connective tissue disease UIP. This is the difference between straight edge in connective tissue disease UIP and the IPF UIP. Here, the honeycombing extend along the plural aspects. Here, there is sharp demarcation and it's almost only involving the lower lobes and no involvement of the upper lobes. This is the straight edge sign. You can suggest this is due to typical UIP pattern, secondly to connective tissue disease. Here, if we find the typical UIP pattern due to presence of the honeycombing, but there is upper lobar air trapping. So this is an alternative diagnosis, not IPF. So this is typical UIP pattern in the conclusion, plus presence of the lobular air trapping in the upper lobes. And both together, with detraction bronchiaxis and bronchocentricity of the abnormality. Uh, I didn't tell you the, what the meaning of bronchocentricity. Bronchocentricity means that the fibrosis seen along the bronchovascular bundle. You see it as three elements, traction bronchiaxis, ground glass around the bronchus and auricular reticulation. This bronchocentricity, this is against IPF. IPF only include the periphery. Every abnormality from a regular reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis, and honeycombing, only peripheral. If they are present along the bronchocentric distribution or peribronchovascular distribution, so this against IPF, and it could be secondary to another disease. Here, there is bronchocentricity of the abnormality. There is upper lobar air trapping. There is honeycombing. So the whole picture is typical UIP, HP, chronic hypersensitivity rights. Okay, if someone can ask me. It's sometimes we can see air trapping in case of IPF, UIP. I say yes. Only allowed to see air trapping, lobular air trapping to see them in the lower loops. Presence of air trapping in the upper loops, not allowed in case of IPF, and it's sign for HP. This another example for typical UIP due to hypersensitivity in nominites. This is the bronchocentricity here. I've seen along the bronchovascular bundles. There is traction bronchiectasis within the lung parenchyma, not only peripherally located as in case expected to be IPF, but here extension along the bronchovascular bundles or bronchocentric make it HP more. What else? This another coronal scan from this patient to show that bronchocentricity of the findings, the traction bronchiectasis. This is not allowed to be seen in case of UIP due to IPF. What else? Here the abnormality is upper, upper lobar, but not basal. So this distribution is against the epicobasal gradient distribution of IPF UIP. We are done with the typical UIP, either IPF or secondary or alternative diagnosis. Now, we are proceeding to the probable UIP. Everything we mentioned about the features of pulmonary fibrosis to be present in case of 
typically IP is here, except one thing, absence of honeycombing. You will see a regular reticulation, peripheral in location. You will see the traction bronchiolexes and bronchiexes, but lacking the honeycombing, plus no bronchocentricity. Here the bronchi are normal within the bronchovascular bundles. No bronchocentricity here or here in the other case, but only a regular articulation along the periphery or subplural location and traction bronchiexes, bronchiolexes. No bronchocentricity. I emphasize this because this will differentiate the probable UIP from the indeterminate for UIP. Once you reach the confidence also to the probable UIP pattern, don't mention differential diagnosis. This will give the same bad impression I told you about it. If you report differential diagnosis for probable UIP, it means that you they don't understand the topic. You don't understand this classification. This classification aim to save the patient from having surgical lung biopsy as much as they can, how they could in the as a multidisciplinary team. So there is debate regarding then the need for surgical lung biopsy. I, I mentioned before between the Fleschner Society versus the American Thoracic Society and others regarding if probable UIP need biopsy or not. Here, you are unable to differentiate primary or secondary. In, although it's not secondary. Secondary means, I want to emphasize that, secondary means uh, the connective tissue disease. Because the UIP pattern can be primary, as we said, IPF, or secondary. Secondary to who? The connective tissue disease. But if you find something like air trapping, as I show you before, this is not secondary. This is alternative diagnosis. This is another entity. Because connective tissue disease as behavior, it's present by interstitial pneumonia. One of them is the usual interstitial pneumonia. So this is considered secondary. But presence of another entity like typical, sarco typical UIP can be seen in sarcoidosis. This is not secondary UIP. This is alternative diagnosis in asbestosis also. And the third one is the hypersensitivity pneumonites, which I show you some of uh, examples for that. Here about the debate again, usual interstitial pneumonia and probably UIP. Both, it's the typical, this is the probable. Guideline-based diagnosis of IPF can be made without further testing, like surgical lung biopsy. But in case of indeterminate for UIP, or alternative diagnosis, this could be need, need in this need need to proceed to the further testing like surgical lung biopsy. Others like American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society, recommend recommend here the bronchial lavage, surgical surgical lung biopsy. Recommend them. For the probable UIP, indeterminate for UIP and alternative diagnosis. These histopathological testing not recommended for UIP, and this can let the pulmonologist proceed to the use of antifibrotic drugs. And they are confident with the diagnosis by HRT as a typical pattern. The probable UIP. I want to share with you this one. This was a, an article showing that the biopsy is more likely needed in case of the atypical IPF presentation, like the patient is young in age, she is female, never smoker, known autoimmune positive, there is exposure like for HP. So this patient with this pattern of probable UIP in HRCT may need to proceed into biopsy 
But in case of typical presentation, it's less likely to need biopsy. In case of the typical appearance, peripheral located, no bronchocentricity of the traction, bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis, and irregular reticulation. So this patient, by multidisciplinary team, can reach the diagnosis of IEPF without the need of this biopsy. What is the indeterminate UIP pattern? This is the third category of UIP. The importance of indeterminate UIP that 50% of this vague pattern proved by biopsy as uh, IPF. Whenever you see that there is mild peripheral and basal ground glass opacity with reticulation, in the reporting here, you start to use the differential diagnosis. If this is my case, I will report it cellular, this picture, presence of ground glass opacity, preferably located with mild reticulation, picture suggestive of cellular non-specific interstitial pneumonia, early UIP pattern to be considered. This will be my report. Another way that you can see the indeterminate for UIP, the bronchocentricity of the abnormality. Here, you can see the traction bronchiaxis with around ground glass and irregular reticulation in the peripronchovascular distribution, plus the presence of abnormalities on the periphery. So these are irregular reticulation, traction bronchiaxis, no honeycombing, presence of bronchocentricity, make it changed from the probable UIP into indeterminate for UIP. And in that case, you can report as a conclusion, this is fibrosing interstitial pneumonia with CT features indeterminate for UIP. And the differential diagnosis here will be fibrosing non-specific interstitial pneumonia and indeterminate for hypersensitivity pneumonia. The same here, there is bronchocentricity of the abnormality along the peribronchovascular bundles, bronchocentric distribution, irregular reticulation, traction bronchiolexis, periphery and bronchocentric distribution. You cannot say it is any of the entities, the H, it's, it's not HP, it's not an SIP, all can be a differential diagnosis. You cannot say it's probable or it's typical UIP. You cannot suggest alternative diagnosis. So in this case, when you find there is a regular articulation, ground glass, irregular attraction bronchiectasis, bronchiolectasis, bronchocentricity, again, I emphasize this again, presence of bronchocentricity of the abnormality, make you suggest that this picture is fibrosing interstitial pneumonia with CT features and determined for UIP with differential diagnosis in SIP and indeterminate for hypersensitivity. So the conclusion will include these three entities. Now I will give you a simple approach according to four steps. The first step, check if there is honeycombing or not. Second step, bronchocentric or not. Step three, there is subplural sparing or not. Because I will tell you why subplural sparing in this, my approach. Step four, not UIP pattern or alternative diagnosis. In case of honeycombing or not, if the answer is yes, so you have typical UIP pattern, either primary or secondary, or even alternative presenting with typical UIP. If the answer is no, move to the step two. Step two, there is bronchocentric distribution of the abnormality or not. If no, so this is probably IP. This provided that you have the features of irregular articulation and traction bronchiolexis, bronchiolexis and bronchiectasis, and in the preferred location and no bronchocentricity, so this is probably IP. If the answer is there is bronchocentric distribution, so you will 
search there is subplural sparing or not because subplural sparing is assigned for non-specific interstitial pneumonia so if the answer is no subplural sparing so this is indeterminate uip pattern with the differential diagnosis of in, of in SIP and indeterminate for HP. If the answer is yes, there is subplural sparing, so it will be fibrosing in SIP and there will be a flashcard about the whole interstitial pneumonias in the future, coming future soon. Number four, step four, if you find non-UIP pattern, like you are here having subplural sparing. So this is in SIP directly, no differential diagnosis, this is alternative diagnosis. The diagnosis here is in SIP. What if you find widespread air trapping involving more than three lobes? and including upper loop. So this is hypersensitivity pneumonia. The simple approach is the typical honeycombing, improbable, no honeycombing, no bronchocentric. In case of indeterminate, there is bronchocentric, no honeycombing, an alternative diagnosis, not UIP pattern. For example, subplural sparing for NSIP, air trapping for HP. This is an algorithm. This is the last thing, provided that the abnormality of lung fibrosis, subplural and basal predominant, and no high resolution CT findings suggesting alternative diagnosis. If you find honeycombing, the answer is yes, so it's typically IP. If there's no, so check for the bronchocentricity. If no, so you are with probable UIP. If yes, so check for the other findings like air trapping or subplural sparing. If there is subplural, no sp subplural sparing, no air trapping, so this is indeterminate for UIP. If there is subplural sparing, the answer is yes. So this is in SIP and this is the alternative diagnosis. Another example, the air trapping, if they are yes, so it will be HP. And this is for this uh, flashcard and thank you